This is What's It Like with Dr. Ken Tangent. Hi, I'm Ken Tangent. This is episode 81 of What's It Like. My guest is David Sparks, somewhere in Southern California? Yes, Orange County. Orange County. Hey, I'm in Orange County. We may be in the I same know. place. We're neighbors. <laughs> yes, more or less. Anyway, did you grow up in this area? I grew up in San Bernardino County, which well, is... the um, same thing. Yeah, if you're from outside of Southern California, it's yes. about uh, an hour east of Los Angeles is where yes. I grew up. Los Angeles is interesting because um, we don't measure things in miles. It's always in terms of time. Yes, yeah, it? that's true, isn't it? Because <laughs> <laughs> it, it may, may only be 10 miles, but it could be 45 minutes. So everything, yeah, yeah. everything is scheduled that way. Did you come from a large family? Uh, yeah, I have uh, three sisters and uh, my parents. And then we had uh, my grandparents living with us. So we had a full house growing up. Oh, where are you in the pecking order? I'm last. Oh, the baby the of the family. Uh. Yes, I am. <laughs> yeah. I was born. My parents, uh, you know, I think I was a mistake. My parents were in their 40s when I came around. So it was kind of nice growing up because they were exhausted. <laughs> so long as I didn't get arrested or anything, they pretty much let me do what I wanted. <laughs> Who had the biggest influence in your life when you were growing up? Uh, you know, I wouldn't say one person. Um, both of my parents, you know, I I uh, was fortunate. I grew up in a household where we all got along great. And, uh you know, my parents were influences on me. My grandparents were influences as my sisters and friends. I uh, I don't think there's a single one person. Mm -hmm. The whole village, huh? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it just depend what I was doing, you know, for certain things. My mother was the one who would help me with my homework, and my father would, you know, teach me how to throw a baseball. So <laughs> it all worked out. What was your major challenge as a child? You know, I, I know this sounds milk toast, but I, I really didn't have many i uh I, you know we uh we didn't have a lot of money but it really didn't matter to me and i wasn't even really conscious of it at the time and uh but we weren't poor either i mean we were fine you know it was just a suburban middle class family and i can't really think as we sit here that i had any major challenges i was very fortunate mm -hmm. what was school like for you fun um yeah i was a good student and um uh, a little geeky, but I was also really into music. In fact, I think that was a big influence on me growing up was my music. I was in the um, various, you know, I was really into jazz and I played saxophone and piano and I was in various bands. And as I went to high school, it actually became even more, uh, more of an element in my life. Where did you go to college? Um, Cal Poly Pomona, which is a state school here in uh, Southern California. I went in as an engineering student and came out with a political science major. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of odd. While I was in college, uh, when so somebody told me that, you know, as a guy started as an engineer, I was doing fine in my engineering classes, but I wasn't really passionate about it. And I remember very distinctly one day sitting in my, uh, in my office, and this was back in the Reagan era, you know, and one of my teachers was saying that, you know, he works – for McDonnell Douglas, and you know, one of his projects was to figure out how to make a nuclear bomb the size of a grapefruit or something. And uh, yeah, it just didn't. <laughs> it wasn't something I really wanted to be doing with myself. And at the same time, people were telling me, hey, "If you go into engineering, make sure you're articulate because there's a lot of engineers that are held up in their career because they can't speak." So while I was in college, I went and joined the debate team. And I was really good at it. I ended up ranked, I think, second in the nation at one point in my in the class of debate I was doing. So I was doing really well at it. And following a tournament, there was, a, I think, a federal judge there who said, how come you're not going to law school? And it had never <laughs> even occurred to me uh, to go to law school. But it was kind of like a light going off. And like, because I liked, you know, preparing for and doing the debates. And um, so I switched majors to poli sci with an emphasis in political philosophy because it was completely useless everywhere else, but it did teach me how to write. <laughs> and um, and then I went to Pepperdine Law School, and that's how I got into my profession. It was uh, I kind of fell into it, a happy accident. How did you choose your law school? Um, uh, it was a, a couple things. It was partly financial. I didn't. I, we didn't have any money. My parents couldn't really afford to help me pay for law school, and um, I had pretty good grades, so I, I got some scholarship 
opportunities from some schools. Pepperdine gave me a full ride and, um, and a few others did as well, but I thought of the ones that did. Pepperdine was the one that I wanted to attend. So that's how I ended up there. Mm-hmm. I guess that's not the best reason to go. I mean, if I, I got accepted to USC too, but I was really afraid of the debt that would come with that. Mm-hmm. So um, so I went to uh, to Pepperdine. Did you like the process of becoming a lawyer? Yeah. not. I mean, law school is not nearly as hard as people make it out to be. I think that um, it's fun for lawyers afterwards to say how terrible it was. Um, I didn't really feel that way um, when I was going through it. I, one of the problems I had was I had to keep my scholarship. I had to stay at the top of my class or within a certain percentage. And, you know, as I sit here, I can't even remember what the percentage was. It might have been the 25th percentile. I'm not sure. But it, either way. So I was a little nervous about that because – Back then, I'm sure it's even more now, but back then it was pretty expensive if you didn't keep your scholarship. So <laughs> um, I uh, I worried about that and fretted a little bit. And then I got thinking, someone had told me once, you know, well, if you can bet $1,000, would you get it or not? Would you, you know, get in the right percentage? I said, I think I would. And he says, well, then what are you worried about? And that was kind <laughs> of the uh, the turning point for me. So, I, you know, I got through. I kept my scholarship, and I, I enjoyed it. Um, mm-hmm. the, pro- the process of going through law school is really learning, training your brain to think in a certain way and, uh, and to write in a certain way. And uh, I enjoyed that process. I thought it was fun. So what exactly do you do? I'm a business attorney. I represent a lot of small and medium-sized companies with the variety of problems they have. I, uh, in my day job, I call myself a country doctor lawyer <laughs> in the sense that you know some of my clients I've had for 20 years, and they, um, I'm more of a friend of theirs than their attorney in a lot of ways. And some of them I hear from very frequently, and some of them I almost never hear from. But Whenever they have a problem, they call me and I help them. Or if it's something that's outside of my, you know, my wheelhouse, I will find somebody else to do it for them. So uh, I take care of my clients. I enjoy it. I am very happy with my profession. What's the best thing about your job? I help people. You know, that's that's really what it comes down to. When uh, my kids were young and they'd ask me, what does a lawyer do? I'd say, I help people with really difficult problems. And it's very rewarding to have someone show up in your office thinking that, you know, their life is essentially over and uh, and helping them through that. And in some ways, helping them prevail on it. Or if they they can't prevail over the problem, helping them mitigate you know the damage to their life it, i think it, you know it's not like a doctor i mean when someone comes to a doctor with a problem their life is in jeopardy but it's pretty darn close sometimes let me turn the question around what's the worst thing about your job um the um well i think the the biggest challenge sometimes are the people uh, i run into other lawyers and liars and other people that i have to deal with um uh, that are a challenge, you know, people that you can't trust to do the right thing. Although I, I hesitate to say that because it's so infrequent. Um, I, I generally think people are pretty good and I give people the benefit of the doubt. And usually people uh, live up to my expectation. Uh, although when you do meet someone that's ethically challenged, I guess, for a better lack of a better term, <laughs> in the law profession, it can be really difficult because they they have the ability to cause so much harm. Mm-hmm. What type of person would be good at your job? Um, remarkably, it would be a patient person mm. who doesn't get caught up in their emotions, I think, is the, the real key to becoming a good counselor. Um, uh, I think there's a perception out there from people who hire lawyers that they want the pit bull and the guy who's going to go yell and scream. And in my opinion, that would be the last person I would want representing me. <laughs> I would want someone standing in front of a judge who has complete control of himself and that has got his mind screwed on the whole time, who doesn't react. Um, and that's the kind of lawyer I try to be. But uh, that's... I think the key to, uh, and, and frankly, to keeping your sanity. And um, if you really were to get yourself that wrapped up that you're yelling and screaming of every perceived injustice you see, you're not going to last very long in this profession. Mm-hmm. Aside from going to law school, what would one have to do to get a job like yours? 
I, I think it's a lot of it's writing and critical thinking. Um, when people ask me what should they do in their undergrad before going to law school, I tell them to find something that they're passionate about that they can write a lot about. And like an English major, I think, is a good one. Um, I, th I think it's popular to tell people to get a business major. Uh, but I think learning writing and critical thinking skills is, is absolutely essential. But even backing up from there, I, I go to lunch sometimes with uh, young people who are interested in becoming a lawyer. And I really strongly recommend they spend some time with lawyers and make sure that the ladder is really leaning against the right wall because it's very easy to think, oh, yeah, I want to be a lawyer and to go through this whole process, which is uh, time consuming. I mean, if you're able to do it without any breaks, you can do it in seven years. So that's seven years of your life, probably a hundred thousand dollars worth of tuition or more. Um, and not know that they really want to do it. And I saw it after I got out of law school, some of the people that I went through with law school in two or three years, they were done. You know, they were out of it. Mm -hmm. And they just really didn't stop to make sure that's what they wanted to do. And when they got out there, they found out it was something they really didn't want to do. And it's, you know, it's just dreadful to think about, you know, taking that kind of step and putting all that work into something that you're not really passionate about. What's a typical day like for you, if there is such a thing? Uh, yeah, there really isn't. Um, if I'm in trial, it's, I guess, let me back up. I uh, I am an early riser. I think as I've got older, maybe that's just a natural progression, <laughs> but I find I can think I can think a lot clearer between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. than I can between 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. So <laughs> I get up early and go to work early, and uh uh, you know, depends whatever the problems I'm dealing with for my clients. Ha about half of my work is transactional, where I'm writing contracts and helping them make deals. And then the half of it is litigation type work, where we've got a lawsuit against another company or my client's being sued by another company. And it just varies. And some days I'll be in depositions and court hearings, and other days I'll be sitting at my desk all day typing away. Law isn't the only thing you do, you also do a podcast. Yeah, I do. Um, I'm a Mac geek in addition to my other pursuits, and uh, I've got some notoriety for it. So I uh, I started a podcast several years ago with another lawyer and uh, Mac geek, Katie Floyd, and we do a show called The Mac Power Users, where we talk about how we use our computers and our everyday lives to be more productive. And we talk to other people who are productive with their computers and hear what they do. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's a great show, and the two of you together is a really nice combination. Well, thanks. How did you decide to do it? Um, I think Katie talked me into it, to be honest <laughs> with you. Uh, I have always had a geek bent. I, um, I speak at the American Bar Association. They have a thing called the Tech Show, where it's kind of like ground zero for legal nerds, and we talk about how we use technology in our practices, and I had written and spoken for several other podcasts, and Katie had done the same. And we became friends, uh, meeting at some of the events like Macworld Expo up in San Francisco. And someone said, why don't you guys make a podcast together? To which I said, why on earth would we do that? Because there's <laughs> so many good podcasts already. I mean, they're, especially about Apple-related technologies. Apple really is the people who put this together to begin with. So... Everybody who owns a Mac wants to make their own podcasts. And as you can imagine, there's quite a few Mac podcasts out there. So I was initially against it, but then we started talking and I started thinking about something that I would like that's not there. And that's kind of where we came up with the idea of tackling one subject in depth, sometimes painful depth. And uh, <laughs> and the show really took off and we've got a, a big audience and it's a lot of fun. Are you going to give up law and go into broadcasting? <laughs> if you've ever heard me speak on the podcast, you know that's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it is certainly a lot of fun. I, I've also written a few books. I wrote a book called Mac at Work and another one called iPad at Work for Wiley Press um, about this stuff. So I write a lot about it and I talk a lot about it. Um, but it really is in i guess in my mind it's kind of my cheap therapy and <laughs> i enjoy doing it i'm not sure if i did it for a living if it would be as much fun and i think 
partly the fact that I use this stuff in my everyday job. And a lot of people that listen to me and read me also have an everyday job. It gives me a little more credibility and experience to talk about the kind, same kinds of things that they're running into. Mm-hmm. Any suggestions for someone who wants to do a podcast? Yeah. Um, there's a great talk that Merlin Mann and John Gruber did together. And I'll send you a link offline called, I think it's called voice plus passion or something to that extent where the idea is if you're going to do a blog or a podcast you have to find something that you have both something significant to say and a lot of passion about it because it really is a labor of love and when i first started the mac power users podcast i expected that you know my mom might listen to it but i didn't think we'd have really any audience i mean who on earth would sit around and listen to some blowhard talk for three hours about email you know and (laughs) And it took off, and I was lucky, but a lot of times they don't take off, and a lot of times there are some really great podcasts out there that have less than 100 listeners. But if you're doing something that you really you really love the process of doing it and you love the exploration, why not make a podcast out of it and just see what happens? Because those 100 people who listen to it are going to really love it, and that's still a pretty amazing thing. How do you know how many people are listening? Uh, Well, we have statistics and, you know, we're we're now on a network and the network tracks every download. So it's, we can, we get it down to the the digit, how many people download. But if you, you're on iTunes as well as uh, a a website, right? Yeah, exactly. If if you have a podcast, um, iTunes does not, Apple does not, serve up the podcast for you all they do is act as a traffic cop so if you go on itunes and you subscribe to a podcast itunes will go to some outside place that you've set up that hosts the actual podcast when you say i want to download the mac power users in my case now it's going to a five by five server which is our network and it's grabbing a copy and downloading it and then on the five by five network they say hey we just sent a copy of the Mac Power Users episode, and they tick that off in the box, and we know there was one more download. Mm. So it's 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 pretty refined at this point. But the fallacy is the thought that that Apple is hosting all this for us. They don't. You have to pay someone to host it for you, or or sign up with someone to do it for you. You know. So it used to be that you had to do all this yourself. Now there's a lot of services out there that do it for you. Um, you know, so there's there's easier ways to do it than there. it used to be really quite difficult. And uh, now um, there's a lot of people putting out podcasts who have no clue how it all works, but they still get their statistics and it still gets out there. I mean, I, I would put myself on a level of one to ten at about a six in terms of complete knowledge as to how all of the intricacies work. And I'm lucky that I don't need to know it all. I have people to help me with that stuff. Let me ask you about the the writing of your books. What what's that process like for you? Uh, it's it's another exercise in patience, really. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, I sometimes use the saying with my clients that you know you have to learn to eat an elephant one bite at a time. And if you want to write a hundred thousand word book, that's absolutely true, especially when you're doing it in your free time and you have a you know you have a full time job. So uh, the trick, it's a marathon. And uh, for me, writing the books was, I, you know, I'd set aside four months and I would take, you know, a chunk of it every weekend. And by the end, I would have a book. And it wasn't that hard in the abstract to do it for a single Saturday, but it, it got hard when you start lining them up. But at the end, you have a book and that's pretty special. David, everybody has to give themselves motivation occasionally. How do you give yourself a kick in the pants? The um, I think the underlying theme for me has always been reckless abandon. I try to find things to do that I'm excited about and just throw myself into them. And that has never really served me wrong. You know, if I went to work one day and found that suddenly being a lawyer wasn't doing it for me, I would gulp down whatever that meant and go get a job digging ditches or do whatever else. I, the idea of these people who go to jobs every day that they hate, I think is the most tragic thing I've ever heard. And uh, 
So in terms of motivation, I'm, I'm pretty self-motivated because I do things I love. Um, you know, someone, you know, I got offered a book deal about something I wasn't that interested in. And I told them no. And cause I knew there was no way I would be able to line up those Saturdays for something I didn't love. And, uh, and to me, as I've got older, the, the thing that has really sunk in for me is looking back at the bad decisions I've made in my life usually involve pursuing something that I wasn't a hundred percent behind and inevitably I didn't do my best work in it. So uh, I really try more than ever now to be careful about saying yes to things. And then when I do say yes, I uh, take the hill. I just jump in with both feet. What about when you have to soothe yourself? How do you calm yourself down? Um, well, I, hmm. <laughs> I can get all hippie with you. I, I, I do have a meditation practice, but I don't really like to talk about that, to be to be honest with you, too much. Um, but I, I really do try to observe the world and not react too much and um, focus on my own thoughts and my own hang-ups. A lot of times, especially as a lawyer, you deal with people that can be vexing. And uh, the trick is to observe your own reaction to what's going on and make sure that you're in control of yourself. And uh, And that is something that helps quite a bit every day. Is there an event in your life that has challenged you to the core? There have been difficult times. There always are. I mean, uh, for me, uh, I'm very close with my family. So events relating to that are very challenging. My, um, the passing of my parents was difficult. My, um, uh, one of my sisters was very ill, and that concerned me a lot. And she, uh, she got past that, fortunately. Um, those are the types of events that have always given me the most challenge. Um, in the overall scheme of things, the, the the bruises and scrapes I get in the day-to-day -day life as a lawyer, they really don't bother me too much. Is there an idea or a principle that helps you through your challenges? Uh, patience. <laughs> I just think patience with the world and patience with myself. It's another thing I guess I've learned. I, I'm not that old. I'm only 43 years old. But uh, another thing I've observed as I've got older is... Um, realizing how hard I was on myself as I grew up, you know, I think it's, um, I think we all do this. We're probably all guilty of this to a certain extent is, uh, I don't show myself nearly the patience that I show other people. And I've tried to be better about that as I've got older. If you were giving a commencement address for high school or college, what would you say? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's so tough. It's, you know, I've always felt like those things are so, uh, there's so many platitudes. I, I think that the trick in life, though, is, is to find something that you can love doing, but at the same time, put bread on your table and, um, and just embrace life. But I, I don't know how I could say that without sounding like a complete dolt. <laughs> you did fine. I want to thank David Sparks for joining me today. Thanks, David. I appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. I do appreciate you inviting me on and uh, letting me talk about something other than Mac geekery for a few minutes. If you'd like to leave a comment, ask a question, or get more info, go to whatsitlike.info.